All right, folks are trickling in, so we're going to get started in about one minute. I can't tell you all how excited I am to be moderating this discussion with three of my favorite founders. Um, I, I got to curate this panel and handpick <laughs> the best, the best and brightest out there. And I'm also happy that you guys are meeting because um, if it wasn't for a pandemic, I'd love for us all to get together in person. But I have tremendous respect individually. Um, for each one of you, and I'm really excited to, to have a good conversation and for the community to, to also have the chance to learn from you and your experiences. Um, so with that, I'd love to start with some introductions. Um, I will briefly introduce myself, but I'm the least interesting person on this panel. Um, I want to have the opportunity to highlight the stories of, of Karim and Amira and Iman, and uh, we'll dive into some questions as well. The, the purpose of this conversation is really just to be that. Um, it's, we'll keep it informal um, and just have the chance to, um, to, to have a fun chat. So. With that, for those who don't know me, I'm Dina Shacker. I am a partner at Lux Capital. Um, we are a multi-stage um, uh, investment firm with 2.5 billion AUM. Uh, we do everything from pre-seed to growth, um, and I am um, particularly focused on uh, breakthrough technologies improving human health and productivity. And I have the privilege of having um, some folks in my portfolio here on the panel. So. Um, I would love to turn it over to the panelists to do quick introductions, um, and we'll have a chance to, to dive in a bit more deeply in your stories as we proceed in the conversation. Uh, so if you could introduce yourself, uh, where you're from, a little bit on the company, what you're working on, and, and then we'll, we'll dive into a deeper discussion. So let's start with Iman. Sure. My name is Iman Abouzaid. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Incredible Health. Incredible Health is a career marketplace for healthcare workers. Uh, we're rapidly growing, venture-backed, uh, and our vision is to help healthcare professionals live better lives. Um, in terms of where I'm, I'm originally, originally from Sudan, but I've been in the U.S. for a very long time, and yeah, excited to be here. Awesome, thank you, Iman. Amira. Hi, so I'm Amira Yahyawi. I love pronouncing my name in Arabic, actually. Uh, <laughs> and I am from Tunis, Tunisia, and. Um, I run moss.com, which is a platform that helps students get financial aid. It's a fintech, also venture back uh, by one of the best people in the world, like Dina. And, <laughs> and um, we are building a bank. Awesome. Thank you. And speaking of fintech, turning it over to Karim. Hi, I'm uh, Karim Atiyeh, originally from uh, Beirut, Lebanon. I've uh, been in the States for 13 years now and uh, the founder of and, and CTO of a company called Ramp uh, that's focused on, on providing corporate cards and spend management solutions to, um, to businesses. And before that, I, I started and sold a, a company called uh, Paribus uh, that I sold to Capital One in 2016. And that company was focused on helping consumers save, uh, save money. So, yeah. Awesome. I was an early and uh, and, and, and big fan of Paravis. My mom was too, Karim. I don't know if you know that, but she, she loved the product. <laughs> Great. So um, let's dive into to the conversation here. And, you know, we're all together um, virtually now for this TechWadi annual forum, uh, which uh, was meant to bring together leaders, not only from MENA, but and from the diaspora and, and frankly, from all over the world um, to, to talk not only about the companies that we are building uh, or funding, here, but also how our, our, our backgrounds, our journeys, our identities um, may have informed, inspired, or even challenged uh, some of our founding stories. So I want to start there. Um, some of you alluded to kind of uh, you know your either your um, your where you grew up or um, or your kind of heritage. But I'd love to start with that question because it's one that so often uh, folks shy away from, and um, and I think is, is important. So a little bit on your family background, personal background, uh, or forebears, and how that, if at all, informed your thesis, your your founding story. Let's, let's feel free to jump in. It sounds like uh, maybe Iman, you want, you want to start? Yeah, happy to start. Uh, it's actually a pretty big part of my life and journey here um, in entrepreneurship. Um, so I'm originally from Sudan, and both my grandparents were entrepreneurs. Um, my grandfather ran the, one of the first transportation companies in, in Sudan. And then uh, my other grandfather just had like 
he was a executive at Shell and then left to start his own companies too. Um, and it's, that's kind of just been kind of embedded in me <laughs> from like a young age. And it's been really inspiring. Like, like basically what it's done for me is it's made me quite risk taking. Uh, it's also led to me uh, creating a belief and a value that I have that entrepreneurship is like the epitome of what you can do with a business career. Um, and it also just like, just like the pursuit of just the high ambition and like trying to change categories and so on uh, was kind of embedded in me in, in, from a pretty early age. And a lot of that is the influence of my parents, my grandparents. Um, but yeah, the cult culturally, I mean, I'm sure we're going to hear from the other panelists in a second, like there is a strong uh, culture of entrepreneurship in, in, in those countries. Right. And, uh, and so that I've benefited dramatically from that in, in terms of my mindset and how I think. Absolutely agree. Kenny, I see some not some nods. Yeah, I think uh, I mean I think it's the case for a lot of the, the, the countries in, in the region. But I guess growing up in Lebanon, we we uh, learned not to take anything for for granted, and that things could go uh, south and, and, and sideways at any time. So there's the, an element of expecting the worst and and being ready for it and, and knowing how to deal with it when it happens. That's sort of been embedded in our lives from a very young age. So. Over time, I guess I've learned to keep the, the, the lows high and, and, and the high lows. And over a long entrepreneurship journey, I found that, I found that to be helpful. But uh, <laughs> having experienced uh, a lot of uh, scenarios where you feel like it's, it's the end of the world and, 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 uh, and, and you need to like, think on your, your feet and, and adapt quickly has, has certainly like, helped shape how I deal with uh, crazy, stressful, or unexpected situations. <laughs> For sure. And speaking of crazy, stressful, and unexpected, Amira, um, I'd love for you to share a little <laughs> bit about your, your, your story, your journey, and I know that had a profound influence on your vision for Moss. Yeah, it's pretty much the opposite of all of this. So I, uh, I would say no one, absolutely no one in my family have it, has it to do what I'm doing or can understand it. <laughs> uh, or uh, it, it is so funny because like what is big moments uh, by Silicon Valley standards are like completely non-interesting moments by parents and family standards. Um, so that is fun. I mean, my, my background pretty different. So I come from the human rights world. I was uh, extremely active in, uh, in, uh, in the Arab revolution and the revolution in Tunisia. Uh, and prior to re the revolution, I was actually kicked uh, out of my country um, and was just stateless human rights activist. So that's all I knew. Uh, but uh, I just like maybe last year discovered that all of, although it looks so far away, it's actually pretty close to what I'm doing. Moss, the reason why I wake up every day for Moss and I actually had no clue what even a seed round meant three years ago. Um, the only seed I know is like make trees out of it and <laughs> that was it. And um, <laughs> and I had, it really, I mean, all of those words were like completely um, foreign to me and, uh, and I moved to the US only three years ago. So also like English was really not a language that I used to speak. Um, but I would say that um, maybe the fact that like you have to advance in a climate of adversity uh, very hard, um, that you have to keep faith in what you're doing, even when it's slow, even when it's not clear, um, that the reason you're doing this is really very, very embedded in you, um, means that you're not, you're not there just to succeed, you're there because you want to do it. And, uh, and um, and I never thought that Tunisia would become a democracy ever, but I was willing to die for it. Um, same as what how it is with Moss today, and it impacts a lot the company and the way. Also, I manage the company, or um, I think of hiring, or a lot of like those facets of like coming from the movement and the legal movement and and doing the revolution is something that I continue wanted to see with Moss. So that's maybe 
the common background. That, that's great. Thank you so much, Amir. And I think you brought up a really important point. All of you did actually in that, you know, um, certainly the sort of immigrant hustle is, is something that has has generated some iconic and, and generational companies, but uh, but to some extent there is something also challenging um, about. Of course, there's. It's not just challenging. It, it's actually counterintuitive and, and in some cases irrational to start a company from scratch and to explain that, you know, um, and 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 to have the conviction to do that. Um, and I so I totally um, get you know get get that side of the coin as well. One question I wanted to ask about um, is, is is related to the kind of problems that you all are taking on in your in your uh, in your companies. You know, we alluded to them very briefly in, in the introductions, but uh, on this panel we are um, talking to three, in my opinion, of the most impressive founders, backed by the best investors in the business, not just me, but um, <laughs> the most iconic um, uh, firms behind you. And you all are not taking on easy problems. You're taking on healthcare, you're taking on fintech, you're taking on education. How have you been able to overcome and, and really push through these highly regulated industries, and in particular, given the last year of the pandemic? Whoever wants to jump in. I mean, I, I could cheat a little bit on this one, and I think I'd be lying if I didn't say that it, it, it's it's not like it's a lot easier the second time around. Um, uh, and and part of the reason we, we landed on, on on fintech is we were trying to think about uh, industries where we would have some kind of a competitive advantage based on, on on the things that we had worked on before. And fintech is one of those industries where if you start with a, well, you can skip a couple of steps, and it gives you a competitive advantage. So. Uh, there's that paired with the fact that I think the past year has been like an incredible year to uh, uh, to fundraise because given that, that capital has been so cheap that like if you are in an industry where where capital is a competitive advantage, um, it makes it easier. And then uh, part of what's really interesting about fintech and, and certainly drove me to it is the fact that to really escape gravity as a company, you have to get a lot of things right, not just product, not just engineering. Also capital markets, also like equity fundraising, also risk, um, and you have to get people who are the best in their fields in fields that are like totally different from each other. So it, it's it's sort of very hard to like get that like initial foundation um, and and attract the, the right types of people to the business. But also like part of the reason that we were so excited to to start a company in this space is like you get to try and pull some of the best people in in in, in their fields respectively and get them working together absolutely yeah, yeah. I think you, uh, sorry go ahead please Iman. yeah I, I was going to speak to just healthcare specifically um yeah. it, it's a the, the one the one opportunity we have is that the this industry is just like rife with problems very significant problems of of cost of access of quality um, and really you just have to like take your pick in terms of the pro the significant problem that you want to tackle um, I do think like in a, in this moment, and especially in the last 12 months, this is an industry, healthcare has been an industry that has had to adapt whether they like it or not. Um, and uh, because their, their consumers, i.e. their patients have just dramatically, uh, their behaviors have completely changed. Um, and so the other thing about this, in, about healthcare is like the amount of competition in healthcare continues to increase, uh, not just within the industry, but like there's people in other industries who are like encroaching on it too. So uh, you have, to, it's almost become a, it's finally at a point where you better compete and stay ahead or you'll, you're you're going to get left behind. Um, I think probably the biggest challenge of this industry is the regulatory capture, to be honest. Like, yeah, it's an, it's intensely regulated. And so you'd have to be able to navigate that. And so for, for when I think about it, just from an entrepreneurship angle, uh, w for myself, as well as when I'm talking to other healthcare founders, is like, whatever you come up with, has two critical requirements. Number one, whatever you come up with needs to be 10 times better than what's already out there. Cause that's like the level of difference that is needed to, to cut through this regulation and stagnation and so on that's going on in this industry. And uh, the second is um, business model matters the most in healthcare, right? Uh, people, people think that it's gonna be beautiful interfaces and a wonderful user experience and all this. like, no, not in healthcare. Like whoever's paying uh, and how the money flows is actually the most critical thing in U.S. healthcare, at least. Um, 
And so it's all, it's, it's well and good to have a beautiful product. If you don't know how you're going to get paid and how the money's going to flow to you, then like you're, you will not survive. That's absolutely right. Yeah. 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 And on my side, I think, I mean, honestly, you cannot make omelets without breaking some eggs. So uh, I have a rule with my, uh, with, with, so basically like a lot of it is like finding lawyers that are really knowledgeable, but are not the type of like, everything is a no. And uh, just this morning, like 9 a.m., I had a meeting with uh, with uh, FinTech lawyers and uh, my intro was like, basically you have to help me not get anyone in my team in jail. <laughs> and <laughs> so starting, that's your benchmark, but like don't make me like slow. And, um, and regulation is there for a good reason, but also uh, is there sometimes for bad reasons and you, you really need to, to, to make sure what, why you're doing something and is it really worth the risk you're, you're taking. In our case, uh, we definitely did illegal things uh, in the first two years and, um, and we will keep doing them because they make sense. But um, there is a very important part, which is like, you're, you don't cheat. You have to explain why you're doing things and, uh, and that unfair systems cannot be solved by just abiding by certain rules. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, de it depends. If it's good for the users, it's worth taking the risk. If it's not, then it's not. Um, but definitely there is no change that happens just by just accepting everything as a yes and just like move with the rules of today. The rules of today are going to change anyway. So, and I think as an entrepreneur, and if you're building something new, it's your role to be the one leading also that change. I love that. You know, I, I think that's a great segue. One of the last things you just said around, you know, uh, no and hearing no into my next question, uh, which is about fundraising. And we have a lot of maybe prospective entrepreneurs who are listening, um, a few VCs on the other side of the table as well. Uh, there's today is uh, is actually equal pay day, and um, you know there's a lot of discussion. Um, that there has been, thankfully, in the last few years, in particular around you know diversity uh, and inclusion in venture on the cap table side, as well as um, uh, you know on the founder side. Um, and that is not just about women, um, but uh, certainly also around. Um, uh, other other demographics and in particular on race and the sort of intersectional founders who um, who 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 are both um, who are different not only in terms of their gender but also in terms of their race and heritage it's it's challenging so I'd love for you all to share some experiences about the fundraising side some advice that you wish you could have given yourself in the, in the early days or that you would give some prospective entrepreneurs around the room because you have raised uh, all of you have raised from some of the best investors out there and are really role models to uh, to entrepreneurs from the region and here. Yeah, I can, I can answer that. Um, yeah. Sure. Uh, my f first tip is just uh, make sure you actually want venture capital and need it. Because <laughs> um, it's like it's like a whole thing. It's like a whole can of worms when you go down that route. Um, and so if, if, if the level, if you're committed to building your company over the course of 10 years, if you're ambitious to ultimately IPO and so on, like, yeah, absolutely go for the VC route, but it may not be right for every company. Um, so let's say, let's say you decided that it is the right route for you. Um, I, my, my number one tip is around compartmentalizing. I mean, the, the truth, Dina, you're absolutely right. The data shows that the odds are stacked against certain groups. Um, and it's very obvious in the data. Um, and uh, but unfortunately, as a as a founder, as a CEO, mm -hmm. like you're doing yourself a disservice even thinking about that stuff. <laughs> you actually have to just completely compartmentalize it, separate it, get, get it out of your mind and just like go for it. Because um, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you, you have to overcome and and work against that existing bias that's in the system in order to achieve your goals. Interesting. So so. Um by compartmentalizing it then, do you, is it literally just ignoring the data that's out there not reading it? Or do you feel like internalizing it um, and, and being conscious of that or being very forthcoming about that in some way has helped you in your fundraising journey? Yeah, 
I think it's good to acknowledge that that that, 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 that there a problem exists. Yeah. Uh, but it cannot you cannot let it uh, factor into how you pitch, who you pitch, yeah. um, like at all. Like you, you effectively what I say is like, hey, just pretend, pretend you're a white guy, okay, <laughs> and then go pitch. <laughs> like go like forget about the 30 years of baggage that you've accumulated because you're a woman or a minority or whatever, or, or an immigrant or whatever, and just pitch like a white male, highly privileged, you know, American. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and that's how you have to come across because that's honestly what it takes to get deals done. Like you have to be extremely assertive and very confident yeah. um, in order to raise from the, from the tier one uh, of venture capital firms. Amira, I, I am going to put you on the spot here because I remember when we were talking about your Series A um, and and you, the way that you were thinking about constructing your cap table. And for those who don't know that, you know, uh, it was a very, very competitive round. Yeah. Everybody was around the table trying trying to, to get a piece of this. Um, and um, I was lucky to to be in that. Uh, but I know that you were thinking this very, very carefully about what you wanted uh, your board to look like. So can you tell us a little bit um, about what you were thinking and, and how that has either met or, or or not met your expectations over the last year? Yeah. Oh, I have so many things I want to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, many. so first of all, everything you man said, like completely second that. Uh, victim mentality will get you nowhere. Uh, you can hate it. I mean, you can cry, you can talk to your friends and name everyone a racist, but <laughs> victim mentality during fundraise will actually kill you. Uh, and I've seen it so many times uh, over and over and over. They said no because I'm a woman. They said no because I'm an Arab. They said no because I'm an immigrant. They said no because my English is bad. They said no this and this and that. So that's completely second Iman's uh, point here. Um, two is listen, <laughs> like no's are not just because that person is stupid and, or they don't understand your problem, what you're trying to solve or whatever. Like sometimes I know there is this like myth of against all no's, they built a unicorn, <laughs> you know, I know, but really like if you get to know stop and listen and take it for a real one, a real no. And, and with time you will understand what is a good no and a bad no, but really listen, like stop again. Victim mentality about the no also needs to be complete. It needs to disappear during this process. And third is there are different ways you could raise. You could raise with amazing numbers, with amazing story, with amazing this, with amazing. And while you could get away with an amazing story in the beginning, you're not going to get away with an amazing story at Series B and C and D. So you can go for three years, maybe four years with an amazing thing, but you have to deliver and it's not just about like talks. And in here, uh, yes, as a seed founder, you have to be good at telling the story. And if you're getting way too many no's, like, Look, like maybe record yourself and listen to yourself and what you're what you're saying maybe it doesn't make sense maybe what you think is an maybe not like do the research be, be intellectually honest when you're when you are within your own intimacy like am i bullshitting people and i'm angry because they don't get it or <laughs> is it true you know and and really like question yourself uh because it, it is important, it will make you improve. In terms of us, I mean, losses, fundraise, yeah, I mean, it was pretty crazy. And, and uh, I mean, I, had, I didn't have a benchmark, to be honest. Like, I didn't know it was that crazy after understanding that it was that crazy. Um, and so we ended up, I mean, Moss Series A was led by Sequoia, and the Lux was the other fund in it, and another third fund, and that was it, and then uh, investors. And in there, I was the one uh, imposing some rules, because when you are in, in, in position of power, also like you can enjoy it. That was not going to happen at every round. And in here, for me, um, I was like for equal 
for equal opportunity, I'm taking the women. <laughs> so I took the three, uh, three women GPs because they were like absolutely brilliant and as good if not better than the guys that I got. And, um, and it was, you know, a choice because at the end you can choose. And then like what, what, choose what matters to you. And that for me mattered because Moss's seed round um, was, I think, 15 people, zero women, because I actually met no women at the time. I mean, as you remember, Dina. Uh, and I really met the first woman in, in venture thanks to Moss's series. Eh? Like I, I knew nobody at that time. So anyway, but that was my decision. And I actually didn't take the highest offer also. Like, it's not only about the money. I took the one that I thought was the best for the business for different reasons. And you have to have, you have to have design criteria and you have to abide by them. Like, if you are, if you decide on five things you want and you can afford those five things, don't get away because someone is offering you, I don't know, like, five or 10 or 20 now, like offering you 20 million more because money is cheap. And also don't raise just because you're, because money is there. Like really think about it. This is an important decision. You're diluting yourself. You're diluting your, your team. You're, di you're I mean, fundraising uh, is unfocusing everybody. So make sure also you're not getting yourself into fundraising when you should not. Um, I would say that is like, especially now it's just absolutely absurd what's going on. Uh, so don't fundraise just for fundraising. And in Moss, uh, we think of fundraising as the failure, <laughs> uh, which is like, basically we couldn't be that insanely, <laughs> you know, successful that we can not afford to fundraise anymore, you know, so we still need capital and, and it's, it's never, I don't think of it as a good thing, you know, necessarily. That's great advice, Amira. Um, Kareem, I know you mentioned, you know, the benefit of having um, started and sold your prior company. Are there particular lessons from that experience that, that you want to highlight for prospective uh, entrepreneurs down the road with regard to fundraising? Oof, many. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, when we sold our first company, I mean, it, it was a question, right? Like, do we keep going? Do we do we sell the company, and and do we uh, uh, so do we keep going? Do we raise more funds, or do we sell the company? And I think the big uh, variable in the middle of all of this is is, is time. Like, how do we value our time? Um, how do people who have made a bet on us value their time? Um, how are they thinking about what's next? Can the amount of money that they're making from this acquisition? position them for more success uh, faster. And, and that's what it came, came down to. Uh, funny thing is, is within, uh, I don't know, like two or three months of selling the company, the people who, who uh, left uh, Paribus and Capital One to go, uh, to go on, on, on their own journeys had a much easier time fundraising than we did uh, raising for the first company. So, so Karen, who was our, our, our VP of engineering, went in and raised for her company, Everbody, uh, I think it was a couple of million dollars within within like a, a month of starting the company. Nick uh, Greenfield went and started uh, Candid, which is now uh, now employs I think more than 200 people and, and has raised a lot of funds. So there's an element of of uh, it, it's definitely very true where like once you have like a little bit of, of success with with one company, like the people who helped you get there will have many more opportunities than 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 they did uh, than they would have had on their own if they didn't have a success under their belt. So like one way to open up opportunities and, and opening it open like make it easier for more people to fundraise and start their companies is is to give them a, a successful a exit relatively early on, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that that everyone on, on this panel will will, will see that uh, at some point where the, like people will start to leave the company and, and start their own uh, companies, and I think it's up to us to like support them, fund them, help them, and uh, in this way like we'll, we'll have many. Uh, uh, aspiring entrepreneurs who, who come from uh, different backgrounds, different life stories, and, and will have these opportunities because it's no longer just up, up to Sequoia to decide, uh, to kingmake and to decide like who 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 does it and and, and who does, but like it's it's ex founders, it's operators, it's people who've been there who know what it takes, and I'm very excited for that, for more operators to back other operators and and uh, for fundraising not to be. Uh, just controlled by by uh, by a few firms. 
That's absolutely right, Kitty. And I just realized you have a, a Paribus uh, uh, diaspora, like the PayPal mafia, but for, for very much with, with those founders who have gone on to start their own companies. I love that. Um, and, you know, I think what you just um, alluded to in terms of cre helping to create value for, for your team and also for your investors is, is, a, is a great way for us to think about the, the last five minutes of our conversation here in terms of the region and, and the sort of the, the evolution of, of this organization, TechWadi. And one of the reasons, speaking for myself, that I'm very you know, uh, passionate about the, the role of entrepreneurship um, in general in, in emerging markets and in particular in the region is, is exactly that, that it is not only in all of your cases and in the cases of many founders that are here, creating uh, a company that solves a real problem, that is, uh, that is employing people and, and supporting families with dignity and livelihood, but also creating the next generation of investors um, and, um, and, and, and founders. And I think that's incredible. So how did, in your sort of day-to-day -day, uh, roles, because you're all quite busy running um, companies here, how do you think about um, your role back home? Um, so I have, I have one of my favorite quotes, <laughs> if anyone on the boss team here, they would be like, ah, again, uh, <laughs> which is, uh, don't tell me you're funny, tell a joke. Um, and by that, I mean, um, we can spend our time explaining that entrepreneurship is possible and blah, 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 blah but nothing, nothing. Uh, equals just showing that you've done it, you know, uh, and doing it right and hopefully succeeding and and giving back, right? I mean, by giving back, I honestly, um, for me, it's more of like you would, I would, if an entrepreneur reaches out, like I'll be the nicest. And if they are from the region, I'll be like, let me tell you really like <laughs> what I think. And if they are about to meet, uh, from Tunisia, I'm like, hey, this is stupid, don't do that. <laughs> you know, so, so basically, um, like, don't, let's not be yes, people from the region. It's very hard when nobody's here. Uh, say, I mean, you're from Tunisia or Sudan or whatever, people never think of you as being bright, you know, right? Like, they're like, oh. uh, So uh, there is a lot to do, and we're very, very few. Like, it, really few. And I see those, like, diversity things. They don't even put us on the charts. There is yeah. no Arabs on the charts. Because We're all right here. This is us. <laughs> yeah, this is it. You know, I think there's no, you're, you're no, still, it was listening and that's it. But yeah. <laughs> um, honestly, like there is a lot and, uh, and there is responsibility of doing it right and hopefully succeeding. But not, even if not succeeding, like really creating a story about what we built and, uh, and make sure that whoever is back home would hear about it. Yeah, that's great advice. Amen. I mean, I gotta be honest. I don't think I do enough. <laughs> I the, there's definitely a, a feeling of guilt, honestly. Um, and I, what little I do is, if if the founders are already in the U.S. and ideally in the Bay Area, then of course, like I do tend to help founders on weekends and so on with things like fundraising and hiring and growth and whatever. Um, that's kind of it's pretty minimal, to be honest with you. Um, I, I wanted to just like share share a story of how like we really as as much as I want to help the region. There's also like a very, uh, I also sense a very big uh, disconnect and divide as well. Um, so when I was raising uh, our Series A, this is like summer 2019, um, and similar experiences, Amira, right? Like, okay, we've got Benchmark and Sequoia and Andreessen and this, and we can be some picky and all this stuff. I remember catching up with a cousin of mine who, who lives in Khartoum, Sudan, and uh, I started the call saying like, hey, like, hey, how are you? How's it going? And like. She's telling me about how they're in the streets, overthrowing a dictator, that she's in university, the students are getting shot, like all this stuff. And then she was like, and then when she was done with everything she's talking about, she's like, and, and so how are you? And I, I was just like, I'm fine. And I just like didn't even say anything because I felt like I, I was, it, we, we experienced the epitome of privilege and first world, first world privilege here, especially where we all are. And um, I felt embarrassed. Honestly, I just didn't want, didn't even want to say anything to her. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing fine, you know, works intense and that's it, right? Because uh, it, it, the disconnect is, is, is huge. 
how, how do you react in a situation like like this? Because I, it, it almost like frustrates me when I hear people complain in the U.S. It's like, oh, you have no idea like how, how good you have it. Uh, and that's been my, my reaction, but sometimes I'm, I'm afraid to be like very direct uh, about it. Say like, hey, like people have it much worse like everywhere else in the world. Like you're, you're, you're lucky, like just focus on what you can get done with, with what you have. And like, do, yeah, I have that same exact same feeling. Yeah. Like, and I've said it, I've said it to a select yeah. group as well. <laughs> I mean, look at, look, look around the, the, the Zoom room here. You've got Iraq and Lebanon, which has gone through so much, Sudan and Tunis, you know, it's definitely a perspective that helps. Um, we're just about running out of time, but I just really want to thank you all for being so thoughtful and, and candid and, and helpful, um, not only to the folks here, but uh, folks who will be watching this later on. So really, and, and thank you for, for walking the walk or you know, being being funny, not, or what, was, what did you say, Amira? Don't, don't tell me you're funny, tell a joke. Yeah. You guys did an amazing job and you're doing an amazing job telling jokes. You're an inspiration to so many um, and I'm uh, lucky to know you and, and um, Tequati is lucky to have you today. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I guess if, for for anyone in the audience, you want to DM us on Twitter, like follow us, whatever. Like <laughs> happy, happy to help. My Twitter DMs are open, actually. So. Awesome. All right. Take care, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.